Good morning. Today on Spotlight, meet Marsha Callaher, the new president of Troy's Walsh College. Sean Wilson of the Ford Motor Company Fund discusses Ford's newest investment in the city of Detroit and solving the mystery behind a very special University of Michigan photographic collection. It's Sunday, October the 8th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. And welcome to Spotlight. Marsha Callaher, she is the new president of Walsh College, one of our guests today on the program. Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I guess it's still apropos to say welcome to Michigan. Thank you. You came from Pennsylvania most recently. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself so the audience out there knows who you are and what brought you here. Well, similar to many of our students, I was working full time and went to school at night to earn my law degree. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually an attorney. I'm licensed in the state of Texas and Cal states of Texas and California. Okay. And um, wound up getting into education kind of, um, it was one of those things that I thought I had always wanted to do. Uh -huh. And then when my husband and I got married, I had the opportunity to go back and get an LLM in labor and employment law, which I did because it was something I was interested in. And after that, I started teaching as an adjunct professor. And then the next thing I knew, I was full-time and then a dean and now a president. All right, well, welcome aboard. Thank it's, you. It is an interesting background to get to where you are today. Um, you're taking over Walsh College, which goes back to 1923. Um, talk about the legacy of Walsh College and uh, what that has meant to you in terms of where you want to take it. It's an excellent question. Our founder, Mervyn Walsh, was an excellent business person. And in fact, he was working for Thomas Edison. And he heard about this new method of accounting that was very practical and it was created by actual practitioners. Mm -hmm. So he wound up taking classes and he was so impressed and he so believed that the Tr Detroit area needed that type of expertise mm -hmm. that he took out the only loan ever in his life to create the Walsh Institute at the time. He launched his first classes in, the, it, in what we now know as the Detroit Opera House. Mm -hmm. um, he left Edison and started the Walsh Institute. Um, and his values we still adhere to today. He believed in making sure that it was a practical education by practitioners, people who were in the field that knew the day to day and, and what was expected in industry and in business. And he also believed in customer service before that phrase was ever really coined. He believed in the personal approach, uh, which we continue today. So what kind of new initiatives are coming up for that student that's either already at Walsh College or interested in going to Walsh College? And it's in particular for the person that you talked about, they're already out there working. Uh, and they may want to go on and get an additional degree and maybe they're doing it at night or wherever they can fit it into their schedule. We have expanded our cybersecurity programs, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. That's a growing field. It is. I would love oh. to show you our threat lab. We huh. have been okay. designated a, a national center of excellence in cyber defense. And so we have a state-of-the-art lab that where you can see the different attacks going all throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, we've expanded that program to be both a graduate program, an undergraduate program, as well as a certificate program. And this fall we're launching a new program called the Master of Arts in Business. Mm. And this is designed for people who we say didn't seek out business, but they've become so successful business has sought them out. So, for example, a nurse who now needs to supervise people, or an architect who now has to, to manage um, books and marketing and things like that, or an entrepreneur who now has a successful concept but now needs to create a business plan. Is that a growing trend, President Callaher? It is, it is, because as these people who don't have business backgrounds want to advance to the next level of their career, they need the breadth of business knowledge, but not necessarily the depth that you would find in an MBA program. Okay, very good. We need to take a little break. We're gonna hurry right back. I wanna talk about some of the challenges that you face, uh, not just at WASH, but education in general, okay? We'll be back, right back. Don't go away.
and welcome back to Spotlight. I was reading a figure uh, in some of the information about Walsh College, and it was dealing with the Fortune 500 companies here in Michigan and the role that Walsh College has played with that. We are very proud to say that our alumni are in each of the Fortune 500 companies here in Michigan. Not bad record. Not at all. We're very <laughs> proud of that. In addition to those alumni in the Fortune 500 companies, right. our Masters of Taxation program is ranked fifth in the nation and our Masters of Accounting is tied for sixth. As you look at education today uh, and how it's changing, particularly in terms of higher ed and the various challenges that you face, um, what's the most daunting thing that as president of Wash College you're having to deal with? Ensuring that our curriculum is relevant. Um, I think that's a challenge for everybody in higher education. Things are changing so rapidly, especially technology. So it's the exponential change with technology is not only changing what we need to do in the workplace, what's expected of us in the workplace, what type of knowledge and skills we need, but also how people learn. So we've created what we call the Tomorrow and Today Committee. And that committee is specifically charged with looking at what are the technologies now, what's coming in the future, how are, how are people learning, what's the next generation going to be needing in terms of educational opportunities, as well as how do we incorporate technology to teach them as efficiently and effectively as we can. Um, what is Walsh College doing to try to meet the cost of education, which seems to just be going up and up and up, and so many people are unfortunately being almost priced out of getting a good education because of the astronomical cost. One of the things that's been very interesting is the published price is not always what the actual price is. Okay. So there's something going on in higher education called discounting. Hmm. Walsh College doesn't do that. What you see is the price that you see is our actual price. Okay. Um, we're very sensitive to that price and that's one of the reasons why we um, are so committed to, to raising funds for scholarships for students. Right. You went to Lansing not terribly long ago with some of your uh, colleagues of other colleges and universities. Um, was, I guess that was your first time really uh, dealing with the legislature in that forum. Um, what did you say to uh, the legislators who have you know, a real say on what's happening with education today. What, what kind of things did you say to them that you'd like for them to do for education? One of the things that we shared, uh, the organization that I went with is called the Michigan Independent Colleges and Universities. Mm -hmm. So there were representatives from each of the colleges that are part of this consortium. One of the things we shared with them is that the independent colleges and universities make up approximately 2% of the education budget in the state of Michigan, yet we award 26% of all degrees at the undergraduate level. So the 2% that the independent colleges and universities receive that goes straight to scholarships has a tremendous impact given the number of students that we graduate. Okay, 10 years from now, if you're still at Wash College. <laughs> um, what do you hope to, you have accomplished, would have, would have accomplished? 10 years from now, I hope that people will say that we stayed true to the values mm -hmm. and that we were true to the mission of Walsh College and that we continue to be innovative the way Mervyn Walsh was and that we continue to be at the forefront of using technology, which is also something that was very important to him. Absolutely. President, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, that question actually takes me back to when I first came to Michigan. Okay. And when I first got here, I had so many people that came up and told me how Wash College had changed their life mm -hmm. through education. Mm -hmm. um, single parents who were working full time and went back to get their education at night or did so online and there are wonderful stories about how their children sat at the kitchen table with them and, and how watching their parents work on, on, on their textbooks and, and on, on their lessons mm -hmm. reinforced in their children the importance of education and how as a result of that their children had gone on and, and earned advanced degrees. The stories 
from so many different people, and they were unsolicited about how Walsh College changed their life. Uh huh. I think it made a difference. It did. Yeah. And we all know that when we change someone's life in our community, they change our community. And so I think that what I would want in 10 years is that Walsh College has continued to change lives. We've continued to ex exceed expectations and that we've continued to stay true to our values. Well, it sounds like you've got a good start in that realm and I'm sure that you're gonna be able to accomplish all of that. Glad to have you on Spotlight. Thank you Glad very to much. have you here in Michigan. And uh, I know there's a lot to, to learn and a lot to see in coming into a new state, uh, but hopefully everybody will be extremely welcoming to you. And uh, we'll get you back on to update us on all the things that you're trying to do at WASH. Thank you very much. All I right. appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Coming up, Sean Wilson of the Ford Motor Company Fund. And welcome back to Spotlight down here at the Cube. And joining me is Sean H. Wilson from the Ford Motor Company Fund. Welcome back, Sean. Thank you, Chuck. Good. Glad to be here. You held a press conference just a couple days ago, big press conference on the east side of Detroit. That's right. Uh, announcing that you're investing about $5 million into that community. Absolutely. Tell us all about it. Absolutely. So we're really excited to announce that we're opening the second Ford Resource and Engagement Center mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Detroit. The first one is located on uh, um, uh, Detroit Southwest side inside the, the Mercado, the old Mercado building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was a I've 10 been million, in there. Absolutely. Yeah. That was a $10 million yeah. uh, investment. Uh, and so we, we decided to open up a second one on Detroit's east side uh, with a $5 million investment. And, and what makes this one different is that we actually partnered with DPS Foundation and DPS CD um, to house it inside of an operating school, Fisher Upper Magnet Academy. Is we're hoping that this Ford Resource and Engagement Center, with all of your help, is a catalyst to be more than what's inside these walls and more than what's inside these students. It's a long-term vision for how we can successfully give the students in this school and in this neighborhood and the surrounding area Hope that there's a better tomorrow. This investment today by the Ford Fund um, with multiple partners is really about investing in the future. Um, it's about ensuring a return on investment that goes beyond dollars, but actually investing in human beings in a community. I want you to remember when you become a citizen and you're able to buy a car. And I know you like what the rappers drive, but always remember those that helped you. Always remember that Ford was in that community Honda was not. Toyota was not. I don't mean to say that. I'm sorry. Um. Today, it shows that we are investing. We often say the children are our future. Today shows the children are our now. And if we don't get them past now, there is no future for them, and there is no future for us. Um, and so there's about 500 students in the school. We have about 10,000 square feet uh, worth, of, uh, uh, worth of space where we're okay. providing wraparound services, not only to the students, but to their families as well. All right, and for those who don't know, uh, that's Detroit Public Schools yes. Community District. Um, using the first one, which yeah. I've been in, uh, the one in Southwest is Mercado, and this one, what did you get out of that one that made you say, okay, we've got to now do this in a different community on the yeah. east side, but in the neighborhood? Absolutely. So, so a couple things. One, um, we saw that the first Ford Resource and Engagement Center really became the heart of, of that community uh, in, in, a, in a major way. So that was fantastic. Second of all, we saw that we were able to uh, really put uh, neighborhood participants on this pathway to economic mobility or social mobility. Uh -huh. So it's not just about delivering services, it's about how do you, these services then lead to a better life, to quality of life. Uh, and when we measured that, we saw that for every $1 that Ford put in uh, to the community, the, the community received $3 in services. So whether it was um, you know, receiving services from Gleaners, Lased, Sarah Metro, Matrix, you, know, you name it, the community was really, really benefiting at, from a three to one ratio. So when we looked at that, 
we so wanted to. So it's really about partnerships. It's about partnerships. It's a, it, absolutely. And so when we looked around the city to say where should we put the second one, mm -hmm. you know, there's no better place than to invest in in education and in the students. Um, and if we can help to uh, remove some of the barriers uh, for the for the students and the families to reach that economic mobility, to go up that ladder, to break the the, the cycle of poverty uh, in those neighborhoods, then that's what we want to do. We want to be a partner to the community more than anything. Well, you know, we always look out our window here. We see yeah. what's happening downtown. Absolutely. We see what's happening in Midtown. Um, these aren't just business districts. They're also living communities Absolutely. because it's growing with just residents here. Um, but the real heart and the soul of bringing Detroit back is about what we do to turn these neighborhoods around. How did you pick that particular neighborhood? Yeah, so, so to your point, one thing real quick to your point, you know, it's, this isn't about charity, right, mm -hmm. what we're doing. Uh, what we realize is that the neighborhoods that we're focusing our attention on have so much talent. Right, uh -huh. so so much opportunity there, um, and so we know, understand that that's our future workforce. That's where future entrepreneurs are coming from. That's where the innovation is going to come from, from from the uh, from the neighborhood. So that's important. And and when we looked at you know which school to place it in, we literally um, visited. I personally visited 13 different schools. Wow. Uh, and and, and, we, and what was it about this one that said, this is the right fit? So there's a couple things. First of all, it's a beautiful school. It, it was built maybe 12 years ago. Um, second of all, the, the principal and, and Detroit Public School uh, Community District, they were fantastic to work with and, and really um, uh, you know, was supportive of, of this one. And then also, less than a quarter of a mile away, you have Fisher Lower, which is the elementary school, and you have Howlman Community or, uh, Center. So like and educational so stepping stones. Yeah, stone. well, it's almost like a little mini campus. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about where you can set roots, invest, and continue to invest over a long period of time, this made, this made so much sense. You've been involved with nonprofits for a long time. Yeah. Um, what is it that people in the neighborhood yeah. get when they see this type of investment from a major company like Ford Motor yeah. Company, uh, what does it do to them? Yeah. Well, I think our model, the Ford uh, Motor Company fund model in, in doing this work is really about community voice. So what they get first and foremost is a, is a voice. So this process was a two year process where we came into the community and said, we're thinking about investing in your neighborhood. Tell us what's here, what you'd like to see, et cetera, et cetera. Then based off of that, we said- So it was interactive, it and, was interactive. And, and they had say so in it. Absolutely, and then we brought them in uh, another time and said, okay, so now we're looking to put a, a Ford Resource Engagement Center in here. What should it look like? What program should be in here? So we gave them a voice, and the final part So you was, didn't come in kind of big brother and say, no, we know what you we're want, partner. this is what we're going absolutely. to do, only find out, it's like, work with us, tell a us what you want. Absolutely, and the final piece was, uh, before we put out the RFP, they told us what kind of, kind of services they wanted. We mm -hmm. put out the RFP to nonprofits, and the nonprofits had to pitch the community on coming in there and delivering services. Oh, okay. So, so often when you're in a, a grant making situation, you know, uh, the nonprofits feel like they're pitching you at Ford Fund. Right, but but right. really, in this situation, they're pitching the community, and we took the community advice, and that's how we selected the partners. All right, so what's next? Uh, you've done Southwest, yep. you've done the East Side. What yep. do you have your eyes focused on? So, uh, you know, I think one thing that Ford Fund does really well is replicate success, and so we're really focused on getting this uh, center off the ground, duplicating and replicating the same success that we had in Southwest Detroit, and I think the sky's the limit. I think we continue to, to see how we can uh, help to really elevate the economic status of people living in, in uh, neighborhoods um, and, and continue to partner with the community more than anything. Final question, uh, with a company as big as Ford, as big as the fund is now, uh, it does so many things in so many different areas yeah. all around, around the world, not right. just in no, this region. Right, globally, yeah. um, and I'm sure it's got to be tough decisions at times in terms of, okay, where do we divvy up the dollars? But for somewhere like Detroit that is on the move, things are changing, does it make it an easier sale for you inside to be yeah. able to say, we need to do this, this, and this right here in our own community because of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think what makes Detroit so special. And is, not to suggest that you haven't been doing a lot 
absolutely. but taking it up a whole nother level. Yeah, we're in 40 something countries. I mean, absolutely. Globally, you know, we're, we're impacting the world. Uh, but Detroit is special. And I think it's because this is where, you know, Henry Ford laid the roots. This is where Ford Motor Company really, really uh, got off the ground. And, you know, it's nothing new for Ford to invest in community and people. Right. That's what Ford's been doing, um, you know, its entire uh, uh, livelihood, uh, as long as it's been around. And I always love the quote that Henry Ford said, you know, a company that only makes money is a poor company. And so I think from day one, Ford uh, and Henry Ford specifically recognized that the importance of that. Yeah. Sean Wilson, thanks Thank so you, much sir. for coming in, sharing yeah. this good news that's happening on the east side of Detroit. And when they figure out the next move, which he's not going to talk about yet. <laughs> you see the real, way I went he around was, that? He was real smooth I with that. I learned from you. I learned from we'll you. We'll get him back and he'll talk about the next venture. When Spotlight returns, we hope you'll be able to help us unlock the mystery behind a special photographic collection at University of Michigan. And finally today, we leave you with some interesting Michigan history that you, the viewing public, might be of help to the University of Michigan. They are trying to solve, put together a photographic puzzle of sorts. During the American Depression, the Franklin Roosevelt administration established the Civilian Conservation Corps, also called the CCC. It was a program to provide young men with work and some funds to send home to their families. The CCC was similar to the military. Men were organized into camps, given uniforms, room and board, and small wages. They spent most of their time planting trees and clearing roadways in forest and state park areas. Also like the military in that time, the CCC was segregated. U of M's Bentley Historical Library obtained an African-American CCC collection of vintage photographs. To the very best of its knowledge, there were only 14 African-American camps in Michigan. The Bentley has 30 images of young men from two camps that were in western Michigan. The problem is almost no names outside of a few names like Big Jim are on the photos. The photos appear to be from 1937. The Bentley wants to know if anyone knows who these men are. And if so, the library would love hearing from you to help unlock this Michigan photographic and historical mystery. No doubt, there are some fascinating stories behind each one of the photos. We have posted a link to all of the photos on WXYZ.com on our website. Just go to Spotlight on the News section and check them out. We've also posted who you need to contact at Michigan's Bentley Library. Mike Smith is the archivist, and we're sharing his email and phone number on the screen and online. That's it for today. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.